Perfect. So I've been involved with the Apache web server since 1996, which you may have heard if you went to the founders panel this morning. Um, and uh, I used to be based as an independent IT security consultant in London for the last 10 years, but I actually last months moved to this beautiful city of Berlin. Um, I've been involved with security for um, almost ever. Um, not always my, my job involved being in a security-specific position, uh, but it's really where my, my interest is. Um, I'm also a member of the ASF um, security team. What I want to cover in this presentation, so it, it says already it's a beginner's guide to HTTP and TLS. Uh, probably some of you in the audience are not necessarily beginners. Um, but being, uh, ha having worked as a security consultant, I have seen things going wrong when it comes to TLS. It is a complicated topic, and I've seen even um, senior DevOps people or admins getting things wrong. Um, what I want to cover in this presentation is basically start initially with, with uh, a basic overview about HTTP, TLS, cover some basic crypto details. So we'll go through this reasonably quickly. Um, it's just basically uh, mentioning a few abbreviations, names, making sure you have a, uh, you, you know what I'm talking about um, when I when I come to these these topics. Uh, talking about uh, certificates, keys, talking about some basic configuration details when it comes to HTTPS, uh, getting into a bit more advanced topics about protocol configuration. Um, I'll look, go into a little bit of detail about the new TLS 1.3 stuff uh, and also some configuration uh, details or, or, or features, session caching, session tickets. Um, this is a, a generic talk. However, I will use some examples uh, how this is configured using the Apache web server. However, the idea is that these things uh, are applicable to whatever kind of server application you are, you are using. Um, and if I have time at the end, maybe a few more advanced features and, and details. Uh, let's talk about crypto essentials. So obviously, um, public key or asymmetric uh, cryptography is an important part about TLS. That's where you have the RSA, DSA algorithms that, that are important. It's about um, data encrypted with a public key can only be encrypted by the corresponding private key. Um, so basically data being sent to your server can only be decrypted by the server and, and vice versa. Um, and when it comes to signing, data signed with a private key uh, can only be verified by uh, or with a, with a public key, which, which uh, is typically how a browser would be able to figure out that he's really talking to the correct server that owns that certificate and that host name, that domain name. Um, key agreement protocols um, are important because the whole communication with TLS isn't using public key crypto. It's, it needs to use symmetric crypto because otherwise it would be too slow. That's where these key agreement protocols are important. Uh, uh, DH, Diffie-Hellman, or ephemeral Diffie-Hellman, uh, which is the most popular one these, these days. Um, symmetric key crypto, you probably know AES as one of the, the main encryption protocols and algorithms these days, or ciphers. Um, hash function, message authentication codes, um, just to mention the, the basics that exist in this area. Uh, when it comes to hash functions uh, these days, it's SHA-2, SHA-3. SHA um, I think more or less uh, everywhere n by now we've got rid of M MD5, which is basically insecure. Um, so that's um, important. So why do we actually want all of this? Um, HTTPS and TLS, it's about um, three basic things or three important things, which is confidentiality and data privacy, uh, making sure that no one can, can read your data that's being exchanged between um, a, a a browser and a server, or a client and a, and a recipient, or a client and a server. Um, and making sure that only the intended recipient is able to decrypt the data and be able to read the data. It's also about authentication, as I talked about the signing algorithms. It's about making sure that you, as the, the person behind the browser, knows you're talking to the right server. But if you use client key authentication, also, giving the, the server the possibility of authenticating the user um, to figure out or, or to, to log a user in, for example. 
Um, and sometimes not not specifically being mentioned, but it's also about data integrity, making sure that no one is able to tamper with the data, even if it's if you're not able to, as an as an eavesdropper or malicious uh, 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 middleman, basically, even if you cannot read the data, you you also cannot modify the data without causing errors or causing problems. So that's the data integrity part. Uh, just very, very briefly, where this whole thing actually sits in the, in the layer uh, model, basically everything happens on the application layer. HTTPS is not a separate protocol in terms of HTTP. Um, it's really that TLS record layer plus the uh, additional protocols that handle the handshake and, and a few other things. Um, that sit on top of that, plus HTTP sitting on top. So basically, a browser first establishes a TLS connection um, or any kind of client, and then whatever protocol is running over it happens as it, as it would without encryption. Um, these days, um, I think TLS is more, let's say, what's the right word, accepted or commonly being used. Uh, but there's still, if you look at documentation or talk to people, people talk about SSL certificates. When people talk about SSL certificates today, what they really mean, it's a so-called X509 certificate for use with TLS. Uh, SSL was the original secure sockets layer protocol that was originally developed by Netscape. That was in 94. Um, any of these SSL2, SSL3 protocols, even though in many cases still supported by server software or in client software, are deprecated and insecure and shouldn't be used and should be disabled. Um, TLS is what you should use, except for TLS 1. That's also something you shouldn't really be using anymore. Um, 1.1, uh, I think you should only use this un if you have a dependency on a client that really doesn't support anything else. It's not. It's not per se insecure, but it, it's not really what you want to use these days anymore. Um, what's basically, at least when it comes to the World Wide Web and browsers, um, works um, with any reasonably modern browser is TLS 1.2. Um, since August last year, we have the final specification um, being published um, uh, by the... By the uh, uh, as, as an RFC for TLS 1.3. However, it will take a very long time before this really becomes um, supported everywhere. Yes, many modern browsers, recent versions, support 1.3 um, servers as well, but um, the problem is that TLS 1.2 will not go away anytime soon. But I'll, I'll get to that in a, in a moment in a bit more detail. Um, Again, very, very briefly, I don't want to go into the detail of the actual handshake, just to mention that, again, this is that additional layer that, that happens. First, the, the client needs to establish that TLS connection, and that's the handshake protocol. Um, in, in TLS 1.3, this is significantly uh, improved in terms of the, the round trips and the, the time it requires to actually establish a connection. Um, so yes, you, you do want to use 1.3 where possible because it simply saves a lot of time. What's really expensive is the asymmetric crypto, dealing with RSA or, or uh, these, these um, encryption algorithms. They are very slow. It's, it's something that happens during the handshake, and you don't want this to happen, um, or you want this to happen as infrequently as possible. Um, so typically you establish a, a session and you want to maintain that session. So I'll get to talking about session caching and session tickets later in the in the talk. Um, just a few abbreviations. I mentioned X509 already. That's an um, ITU technology standard from 1988, um, which is basically just a standard for public key infrastructures, how these certificates um, keys look like from a, from a format point of view. Um, public key infrastructure is basically, um, uh, if you look at what you have in your browsers and what we use on the World Wide Web, that's basically the, um, how would you refer to it, the, the, the global PKI that, that drives how, how we handle um, uh, HTTPS on the World Wide Web. However, you can set up your own PKI. You can set up 
um, a PKI in your company, you can set up a, a test one for a specific uh, build system or a test server or something. Um, so it just defines the whole domain where you define these are the certificates being issued. This is the root um, CA, uh, like the certification authority, which issues the certificates. Uh, and it issues certificates based on a certificate signing request, referred to as a CSR. So basically, uh, the, the certification authority would not create the private key. The private key is something that remains on your laptop or in a secure location, uh, depending how you, how you handle this. And uh, you would create a so-called CSR and send this to the CA. They perform um, identification, authentication checks, or more like identification checks to make sure that you are the owner of, I don't know if it's about a website, it would be about the domain name. Um, if you run your, your company, uh, PKI, it would be other forms of identification, like making sure that the name is what's, what's in your passport, for example. Um, CAs are also required to maintain um, a CRL, a certificate revocation list, because sometimes, well, certificates expire, but certificates can also be revoked, um, either because someone lost the private key, because they were compromised, um, and clients who um, use these certificates need to have a mechanism to be able to figure out, is this, is this certificate still, still valid? Uh, because the certificate itself doesn't, doesn't tell you except for the expiry date. I'll get to that later in the talk in a bit more detail. Um, just very, very briefly, when dealing yourself with creating keys and sending CSR, there are some common formats and, and file extensions. Um, so basically, what, what you typically have, uh, or what servers, server applications uh, tend to, uh, to accept, either it's a, a PEM-based file, or a set of PEM-based files, or it's a so-called PKCS12 file, like typically a .p12 file. Um, PEM is basically a base64 encoded uh, DR certificate that looks like this. You've probably seen this before. It says begin private key or begin certificate, uh, and then you have the base64 encoded details. And that's the, the DER format. Distinguished encoding rules, I don't want to go into details, it doesn't really matter. It's basically a, let's say, reasonably old specification and format, but that's what's, what's being used. Um, P12 files, the main difference is basically with, a, with PAM files, you have one PAM file with a certificate, public key, and you have one PAM file with a private key. Uh, with P12 files, you typically put everything into a single file, and depending which server software you're using, uh, Apache Web Server wants PAM files, so you have a configuration, this is your private key, this is your, your certificate for the server, um, but some applications want a P12 file, uh, it depends on, on what you are using. Um, again, sometimes you see like .crt or .cr to refer to this as a certificate, um, and maybe .csr to indicate this is actually the signing request that's intended to be sent to a, to a CA. Um, again, very, very briefly, the, the certificate structure of these X509 certificates, um, essentially it's the public key but it's, it's more than just the public key. It includes information about, well, who owns this public key and who owns the corresponding private key. Uh, that's the, 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 the subject. So the subject public key info, that's the public key. The subject um, would be something like the, the, the name of the person on the certificate or the, the domain name. And then additional information about which algorithms are used to sign this, who actually issued this certificate, like what's, who's the, the CA, which is the issuer. So there's several, uh, several things in this certificate to make it, to make it usable uh, by, the, by the clients. Um, the important bit is the, the subject. Um, some of the refer to as a subject at the end, which is a distinguished name, a sequence of X509, uh, identifiers. And the common DN keys, you may have seen this if you've ever created a certificate or key yourself, the common DN keys is CN, the so-called common name. Not sure why it's common, but it's a common name. That would be what shows your host name for your server. 
Um, then there's C for country, state, locality, organization. So we can put information in there. You see an example at the bottom. You can put information in there about what is this, who has this certificate been assigned to, or who is the owner of this certifi uh, certificate. Like, what's the subject of this certificate? Uh, hence, hence the name. Um, you don't have to put um, some of these info. Basically, almost everything is, is optional. Obviously, when you're dealing with um, servers, the CN part is not optional. That needs to contain a host name. Otherwise, um, well, in theory, if you run your own PKI, you can put whatever identifier you want in there as long as the clients know how to deal with this and the servers know how to deal with this. Uh, but anything else, like... Um, Locality or organization is, is optional. Um, so the common name, uh, typically you would have a so-called fully qualified domain name in there, which is like www.example.com. Um, this would not match anything else. It would not match example.com. Um, there's a special case that would introduce, um, I think in the very beginning, which is so-called wildcard domains. So we have star.example.com. So the, the subject of the certificate includes this particular thing, star.example.com, and it would match example.com and everything else unless there's additional dots in there. So it wouldn't match something like www.foo.example.com. Um, but these days, you typically have more than one uh, hostname website on a single server or want to cover with a single certificate. So what was uh, introduced uh, a long time ago are so-called um, yeah, SAN or multi-domain certificates. SAN stands for the uh, is an abbreviation for the extension. That's part of the certificate structure I mentioned earlier. So we can have additional extensions in the certificate, and one is subject alternative name, which contain, which can contain. So it's optional. It can contain a, I think more or less uh, arbitrary list of of host names. You can, I think there's a limit somewhere, uh, 200 something, 254. I'm I'm not sure. Probably depends on the actual implementation. But you can put a a reasonably long list of of domain names and host names in there, and uh, clients browsers know how to deal with that. They just try to find a match in this whole list plus the main CN that sits in the subject um, to figure out if that certificate is for the server that you're that you are talking to. Uh, additionally, there's something called EV certificates, extended validation certificates. Um, you may have seen this before for some websites, especially like financial institutes, banks, or whatever. If you go there, your browser shows like a more prominent green uh, company name or something. Um, uh, and uh, that's basically a certificate that simply contains another extension, like a flag that basically defines this is an EV certificate. Um, they were introduced, well, uh, to make things more secure. If that's really the case, I don't know. I mean, I, I explained this to my, to my mom a long time ago, and I said, well, this is your, if you talk to your bank, uh, you need to see that name there. It needs to be green, and it needs to show the name of your bank. Otherwise, don't enter your, your login details. Uh, and she kind of... We got from this, like, whenever there's some green thing showing up, it's good. Um, that's not really the intention. I think it, it works for users who are more technically savvy, but for everyone else, I, I think it doesn't really help that much. Um, it helps the PKIs because they are really expensive when you want to buy them, so they make more, more money with that. I think there are valid reasons or valid cases where an EV certificate makes sense. Um, but in many other cases, uh, a, a simple normal certificate um, is perfectly fine. Um, and as already mentioned, you can create your own. Uh, that's perfectly fine for, for testing, or if you want to set up your own PKI, if you want to set up in your company, your organization, or just on a, on a, in a, uh, from a technical point of view in a built environment, a hosting environment, uh, where, where you have a PKI which covers that, that environment, that's fine. However, if you create your own server certificate, uh, it doesn't really work because browsers wouldn't trust your PKI. They don't know your certification authority and it will show a, show a warning. Um, one certificate authority, or sorry, certification authority that I would like to briefly mention is Let's Encrypt because it gives you free certificates. 
Uh, that's, that's great. That didn't exist a few years ago. Um, they basically, uh, this is a service provided by the uh, ISRG, Internet Security Research Group, um, since April 2016. So it is a non-profit organization, um, and they provide what's called so-called um, domain-only validation certificates. Uh, you can't have a certificate from them that shows organizational information. Um, it will only it only certifies that you have proved that you are the owner of this domain, um, and it gives you a free certificate. Typically, a certificate from a, a global or public CA um, is valid for 12 months. Uh, Let's Encrypt only does 90 days, but you can, uh, once I think uh, it's older than 60 days, you can renew the certificate, um, and it's a very quick and, and automated process. Um, one thing that I found interesting or actually ran into is if you get a, a paid for certificate from a public CA, um, they have extension fields that define them as valid for server side encryption, but also for client side encryption, um, which is sometimes helpful because if you have a, your reverse proxy, uh, the browsers would use that certificate to figure out that's the server that I'm talking to. But you can also use this as a client certificate on the server talking to via HTTPS to other backend services. That does not work with Let's Encrypt. Let's Encrypt specifically only gives you um, certificates which are suitable for server side encryption. Um, I found this important to mention because I tried that and it didn't work and I didn't know why for, for a while. Um, it's basically available, like the CA is uh, available in every browser. So every, every browser has a, has a list of public CAs it trusts. Well, personally, you may not trust all of them, but um, if you install a browser, that's what's, what's in there, like a long list of, of CAs from every, every country. And if it's anything else, a browser wouldn't trust it and would show a, a, a warning message, which looks like this, um, or something similar. You've probably seen this. Um, so if you create your own certificates, it looks like this. But this also sometimes happens if you simply misconfigure the certificate on the server side. Um, how this often works in browsers, a browser doesn't contain uh, a list of every CA that issues certificates. Um, it often contains just a list of, um, of higher level root certificates. So you have this, this uh, a certificate chain. Um, at the bottom, you have the, 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 the leaf certificate or ent entity certificate. That's your server or client certificate. Um, and it's not the root CA, the root uh, certification authority directly that would issue that certificate. There's usually intermediate ones. Uh, commercial CAs have different ones for different purposes, one for EV certificates, one for domain only, or different geographical regions, um, whatever. Um, so it sometimes requires you on the server side to actually configure not just your server certificate, but actually configure uh, intermediate certificates as well. So the browser may only contain the root certificate that it trusts. If you only put the actual server certificate on your server, it's like, well, I don't know the intermediate CA. I've never seen that. I have no, no idea where that's from. Um, what you can configure on the server side is you can basically configure an arbitrary number of certificates. You need to put all these certificates in there to, to reach a trusted certificate that the browser knows about. Um, and basically, in the handshake, the server would send the whole set of certificates um, and to give the browser a chance to find one that hits a trusted certificate, basically. Um, in, uh, that's just, just briefly about uh, Apache. So Apache has, well, it's still called mod SSL, so it has a, it has a tier, TLS module. It is included as default since a very early version um, of Apache 2.0. Uh, it uses OpenSSL. Um, it supports all the various TLS versions. Um, I think, yeah, SSL 3 is still supported. Um, 2.0 support was removed um, a while ago. Uh, I think we, we need to remove SSL 3 as, as well. It doesn't make sense. It shouldn't be used anymore. Um, but there's still some cases where people may have dependencies on this or whatever, but it is insecure. Um, 
1.3, TLS 1.3 is supported since a recent 2.4 version of Apache. Um, and if you have OpenSL 1.1 in installed, um, um, let, me, let me skip over this. It's just a module configuration. Um, but very briefly, I mentioned this before, talking about the PAM and P12 files. So Apache uh, requires um, you to give it two PAM files. One is your server certificate, and one is your server key. Um, and the, um, the uh, certificate file is the one where you would put the intermediate certificates that I just mentioned earlier. Um, browsers typically handle an arbitrary order of these certificates. Um, but depending on the client, mm, that may not be the case. It actually should be that you sort the certificates in that file starting from leaf to the root certificate. So the top contains your server certificate, and then the one that issued that one, the intermediate one that issued that one. You should not put, um, I actually mentioned root certificate here, but you shouldn't really put the root certificate in there uh, because that's the one that's the, 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 the trusted one that the browsers know about that shouldn't be put in there. It doesn't matter, it would just be overhead if you always send this with every handshake. Um, the browser would be fine, it would stop at that point and say, okay, I'm, I'm happy I found something that matches one of my certificates, so I don't need to check any of the other certificates. Um, let's talk briefly about uh, virtual hosting. Um, it was a problem many years ago that it was difficult to host multiple domains on a single server when using HTTPS. Because going back to the, to the layer model I, I showed earlier, um, TLS, uh, establishing the TLS session happens before any kind of HTTPS request is sent. That includes the host header, which tells the server which domain, which, host, which virtual host you actually want to talk to. So, the server was like, okay, I need to show you one certificate. So yes, one option is to put, use one certificate for all domains, but that's sometimes not, not practical. Um, this was solved by adding basically another feature or extension to, to uh, TLS, or to, yeah, to, to TLS, which is called SNI, uh, Server Name Identification, um, which is, yeah, TLS Server Name Identification. It's basically uh, on the TLS handshake layer, giving the user, uh, sorry, giving the server the information about which domain, which host name you actually want to talk to. So basically, whatever is in the host header would be in that handshake, and then the server knows, ah, in that case, I'm going to do the handshake using this server certificate and not the other one. Um, typically, any kind of server software and client software these days um, supports that. However, it can still be the case that some clients simply do not support SNI. Um, that's an interesting configuration setup you, need, you may need to look at um, because uh, some server software may not handle this properly, some may just show an error message, some may pick the whatever a random one or an unspecified one from the virtual host certificates you've configured. In Apache, it would um, pick the first virtual host um, if a client doesn't send that information in the host header, I would simply pick the first one. There was a behavior before SNI was introduced. However, there's a, for Apache Web Server, there's a configuration um, called SSL strict SNI vhost check, um, which basically I would recommend to enable because these days you usually don't want to talk to any clients anymore, at least when it comes to the browsers uh, who don't support SNI. If there's a request coming in that doesn't uh, have SNI uh, enabled or uses SNI, then it seems a bit odd. It shouldn't really be the case. So in that case, if you have this enabled, Apache will just respond with a, um, I think, a forbidden, um, yeah, a 403 forbidden um, response. And they're like, I can't help you. You need to get your things sorted out, basically. Um, just briefly, um, again, Apache Web Server, I mentioned Let's Encrypt. Um, there's a module called ModMD, Managing Domains. Not sure if that's a, the most catchy name, but that's the, the name of the, the module which handles automatic, uh, uh, basically, retrieval of server certificates from Let's Encrypt. 
So basically, you just configure your, your normal virtual host. You put an M domain, you give it the, the host names, um, a couple other standard things that, that the, whole, the, the, the module needs. Um, and then when you start Apache, it would on the fly fetch a certificate and make sure it gets updated uh, before it expires. It is still an experimental module, but it has been available um, for, for a while and there's some active development around this. So it's, if you're using Apache Web Server, it's worth looking at this if Let's Encrypt is something that would make sense for your, for your use cases. Um, again, there's some Apache Web Server uh, configuration examples, but this is uh, reasonab reasonably generic. If you have a software, server software that deals with the uh, Apache, uh, sorry, uh, that, that uses OpenSSL as the SSL library, um, you may have seen like in the, in the Cypher, uh, Cypher Suite configuration line something like this, where you define uh, which ciphers OpenSSL is supposed to use or not supposed to use. Uh, it looks a bit weird. It has these, these different prefixes for each thing, and you have the colons, and um, it can be reasonably long, depending how, how detailed you want to get into specifying which ciphers are OK or which ciphers are bad. Um, it is one thing that often gets forgotten when server software gets configured. People tend to just leave in there whatever was the default configuration, and that may not necessarily be the best, um, especially for a particular use case, and it may already be outdated. I think even at the Apache Web Server, we are not that good at keeping that up to date. I think we are better than we used to be, but you should always look at that. You should look at what does this say and does this make sense for my for my use cases. Um, so this is the current default configuration in Apache, which is okay, but um, typically you want something um, something more uh, restrictive. Um, in general, I would always recommend uh, specifically, even though OpenSSL um, disables some of the old SSL protocols already automatically, even if you don't specifically disable them, um, at least with the Apache Web Server, there's an SSL protocol uh, directive, and I would always use that to make sure you disable um, the stuff that you don't really uh, need. So my recommendation would be uh, for the protocol, disable SSL v3, disable TLS 1.0 and 1.1, and make sure, or, or thereby making sure that you really only use TLS 1.2 and TLS 1.3 if the client supports it. Um, for the Cypher Suite, again, uh, depends on your use case. This is a slightly more uh, restrictive configuration. What you want is use TLS 1.2 or higher, and you want to use this with strong ciphers that support forward secrecy. What's forward secrecy? Um, basically, if a middleman monitors your, uh, your, your um, session exchange, the data going back and forth between client and server, um, and then at a later point, days, weeks, hours, um, whatever, is able to compromise your server, um, if an algorithm is not forward secure, the attacker would be able to decrypt all the previous traffic. Um, if you have a, an algorithm with forward sec secrecy or perfect forward secrecy, um, that's not possible. Basically, only from the point where something gets compromised, only from the point onwards, the attacker would be able to, to decrypt the traffic, but wouldn't be able to decrypt any of the previous traffic. So that's what I mean with strong, strong ciphers. Um, if you use the uh, mod HTTP2 module with the Apache Web Server, there's actually an, a configuration option that um, enables um, certain security settings and enforces specific um, yeah, security settings and, and requirements for all connections. Um, that can be configured in addition to, to the other things. It's just an additional uh, way to make sure that you not have any legacy things enabled in your configuration. Um, I mentioned TLS 1.3 a few times. Um, again, this, this is potentially a bit uh, complicated, but just very briefly to mention some um, yeah, important changes that, or where TLS 1.3 is better than any of the previous um, algorithms. One is 
it removes support for, for various weak and insecure algorithms. So even if you would want to use MD5 with TLS 1.3, that's simply not possible. Like the clients and servers simply wouldn't be using that. Um, so that's no longer in there, uh, including any of the SSL protocols. Um, it also mandates perfect forward secrecy. So you cannot use any of these uh, weak ciphers anymore. Um, and it separates uh, the key agreement and authentication algorithms from the actual cipher suites. Um, some of the um, SSL TLS vulnerabilities that exist come from the fact that this was all like, um, what's the right word? I wouldn't say cobbled together, but uh, was like all a single protocol handling handling everything. This is a clear separation. This is about the authentication, this is about the key agreement, and this is about the actual um, encryption cipher for my session. It also um, includes some new stream ciphers and, and some new algorithms. And it replaces um, session resumption with uh, pre-shared key cipher suites and, and tickets. I get to that later in the, in the talk. Um, going back to the, one of the first slides I showed, it supports so-called um, one RTT handshakes, like there's only one, uh, one, one round trip, and it has optional support um, for uh, zero round trip handshakes. Um, I think I have another slide about this, but let me mention this briefly. So um, Apache web server at this point does not support zero uh, round trip handshakes. Um, I think neither does the uh, Apache traffic server at this time. Um, or Tomcat, I think. I'm looking at Jean. Jean I think it doesn't. It, it does or doesn't? A traffic server does. Okay. The last time I looked at it, it didn't. Um, it is interesting. Um, it obviously makes things more performant uh, because basically, uh, are we running out of time? Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll keep it short then. So basically. Uh, it requires you to look at your applications because it introduces, um, um, I don't want to say security vulnerability, but basically it, it does because it simply um, reuses existing, um, uh, existing cached information and that can cause um, a security vulnerability. So basically if you have um, no other form of, of uh, authentication happening. It basically um, um, results in, in potential for replay attacks. An attacker would not be able to decrypt any of the data, but it allows for, for it makes it basically trivial to replay the same request. So you, it's not a specifically a bug or an issue in the server software, but you need to look at your applications. If you have an API that has no additional form of identification, authentication, um, whatever, then a replay attack can potentially cause issues. Let's say you have a, a payment system or let's uh, like, a, like a shopping cart and the action of paying something, if I can replay the same, the same traffic to the server again, it would basically execute the same request again. If in your application, on your application level, you don't deal with this information um, that, that this request is being replayed, you have a potential issue. Um, I think going forward, I have the feeling this is going to cause quite a few vulnerabilities, not in the server software itself, but for companies, because the operations team is often different from the development team. Operations want to improve things, make things faster, so they think, hey, this sounds great, zero round trip handshakes, let's enable this. But without auditing and looking at your applications, you, by doing that, you may introduce um, security problems. Uh, so long story short, uh, you need to look at this before you enable this um, in, 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 um, in, in your service. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, TLS 1.2 for now is here to stay. Um, it took a long time to get rid of even SSL L3. So um, this is... Um, Basically, you should make sure that you enable TLS 1.3 for clients that already support it, um, but you will have a dependency on TLS 1.2 for a very long time. Um, only very recent browsers um, support the final TLS 1.3 spec. 
Um, oh yeah, actually, I had a separate slide about uh, zero round trip um, handshakes. Um, yeah, recommendation: do upgrade to TLS 1.3, but you need to look at your your APIs and audit your applications before doing that. Um, random seeds sometimes uh, typically forgotten about, but it is important to make sure that your server has enough random randomness, random data. Um, to actually be able to create the initial keys and, and everything, um, which can sometimes be a problem. So it needs to be looked at depending how your your server application does that. Um, um, session caching. Um, so in TLS 1.2 and, and lower, basically, we have session caching. The, uh, the, the server side caches the session. It's basically, the the um, symmetric key that was agreed in the TLS um, handshake, and when a client comes back based on the identifier of that of that session, the server knows uh, the, the server doesn't have to do a full handshake. It knows ah that's the same client again. It's the same symmetric encryption key for this session, so I'm just going to use that, and every, everyone's happy. Um, but you cannot indefinitely cache session keys on the server side. Also, you don't really want to cache things on the server side because, well, that session is on that server and you may have um, a set of, of high availability servers running side by side. Um, that's where sometimes these sticky SSL session features come from in reverse proxies to make sure that the same client gets always routed to the same backend server. But then that server fails, causes problems. So um, it, it works. It's important to enable. Otherwise, you always end up with a full TLS handshake every time a client sends an HTTP request. Uh, and that's something you don't really um, want to do. Um, and if you have a very long session cache, it, it compromises forward secrecy because um, there are session keys in there from days ago or, or weeks ago, depending how you configured it. Um, so in TLS uh, 1.3, but also in 1.2, you have session tickets. And uh, that's basically, instead of caching things on the server side, you tell the client, well, here's some blob of data that the server has encrypted with his um, yeah, session encryption key um, and tells the, the client, you store this on your side. And whenever you want to send me something again, you just send this whole thing again, and then I can figure out which session key to use for, for, this, for, for this session. Uh, problem here is, again, um, forward secrecy. So my recommendation, I think I'm running out of time, keeping it short for 1.2 is um, if you really, for your application, for your use case, have a strong requirement for forward secrecy, if you cannot live with any cases where a compromise would lead to a compromise of previous data being exchanged with, with clients, you should disable session keys, uh, sorry, session tickets. However, in general, I recommend enabling it, but rotating the encryption key that the server uses for, for this um, on a regular basis, once a day, once an hour, um, depending on, on what's acceptable from a risk point of view for your use case. Uh, for example, in the case of the Apache web server, um, just restarting it basically cycles that, that key. In TLS 1.2, this whole thing has been solved, um, so it's not a problem anymore. Uh, there's no uh, vulnerability in terms of forward secrecy. So in that case, you do want to have this enabled. Um, I think I'll skip over the other. Do we, are we running out of time? OK, uh, give me a few more minutes for, for this. Um, so there were session tickets. Um, OCSP, the online certificate status protocol, um, I talked initially about the certificate revocation list. Um, so a browser talking to a server doesn't necessarily know if that certificate is still valid. Yes, it may not have been expired, but the client at that point doesn't really know if it has been revoked because maybe it has been compromised a few days ago. Um, for this, the, the OCSP protocol was invented. Um, basically, it allows the, the browser, so the certificate contains an OCSP endpoint that the browser can use or the client can use to ask the CA, is that certificate still valid? Um, but that creates lots of uh, issues. There's a privacy issue. You have to send a request to somewhere which, which website you're talking about. It's the efficiency. Uh, it didn't mitigate against uh, man-in-the-middle attacks, etc. Um, 
what you want to enable in your, on your server side is what's referred to as OCSP stapling. Um, it's known as the TLS Certificate Status Request Extension. Wonderful name. What it basically does is the server side talks to the CA and gets a signed piece of data from the, from the CA um, and simply forwards this as part of the handshake to the client. So instead of the client asking the CA, it gets a blob of data from the server, which is signed by the CA, so the client can verify that, that it's valid information, uh, which allows it to say, like, okay, this is um, a recent uh, response from the CA that at least, I don't know, two hours ago, this certificate was still valid, so it hasn't been compromised. So it makes this whole thing more efficient, and the browser or the client really just talks to the server and not has to talk to any other uh, endpoint. Um, a whole different uh, set of configuration in your server software uh, usually comes into play when you want to uh, not just use HTTPS to identify or to allow the server to be um, authenticated towards the client, but if you want the other way around, if you want to authenticate your clients, your browsers, if you have uh, uh, certificates issued to your employees or to your your servers, if you use like a backend service that's fronted by a reverse proxy which uses HTTPS, um, you need to enable client certificate authentication, um, and that basically reverses the whole the whole thing. In that case, this this server would be the client, so you need to give it um, a client certificate um, and uh, make sure that the other side knows which certificates are trusted, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I don't have time to go into the into the into details of this. Uh, again, depends if, if you're really um, if this is something that, that is, is something that you are looking for in your use cases. Um, let me skip over that. One important and last slide then um, I'll finish is not specifically something you can you, you, you have to, um, uh, that's specific to the server software that you are using, is the so-called HTTP strict transport security header. Um, it's simply a header that you configure on the server side. So it's not a feature of your application. Uh, it's just that you would have to configure your server side to make sure this header gets added um, in every response. Um, and it simply tells the client, this website uses HTTPS and will always use HTTPS. Well, always as in you can define a, a max age for how long a client is supposed to cache that information. Um, typically, once you make the decision, I'm going to use HTTPS for everything, you want to put something like uh, the number of seconds for the whole year in there, max age is a bit similar to the cache control header, if you're used to that one. And uh, one uh, advice I would give is when it comes to um, development environments. You may want to look at this configuration because once you've put this in there, um, if you're testing against a, a staging or a development environment, um, you cannot reach the HTTP endpoint anymore with your browser because the browser has, has cached this. Yes, you may, your things may be automated, then that's, that's all fine if, if your automation ignores this header, but browsers will not. Browsers will honor this header and even if you specifically type HTTP, it will not send an HTTP request anymore. It will not do a redirect to HTTPS. It will straight away send an HTTPS request because you told it previously that you do not want to use HTTP anymore. Um, so that's uh, also something that can be configured with uh, ModMD and Apache. Um, you just basically find it just at this header to every response that's being, that's being sent. Okay, I'm out of time. Do we have time for one or two questions, maybe? Any questions on this? Have I confused everyone now with this beginner talk? Or was it uh, too much of an advanced talk? I hope not. <laughs> Any questions? Okay, yeah. What is the place? Uh, is it in an, an Apache web server project or somewhere um, some information about more recent security issues with uh, certificates or with the Java? Uh, where can check uh, 
is my uh, uh, version which I use uh, safe or sometimes uh, as a box in Java, for example, with uh, so SNI, a server name uh, uh, identification, it was a bug there. And some uh, sometimes there is a bug that really make a security, so unsecure some, some protocols. Is there uh, any place on Apache where you can check it? Um, so, if I understand the question correctly, it's about where can you find out about if something is wrong and you need to change something on your side, whether it's a, a bug. Uh, obviously, bugs in Apache software, yes, they, um, there would be a new release, there would be the CVE number assigned and usually some information about how to mitigate the bug, what's the patches or which release you need to use. So that's about bugs in Apache software. If it's a bug in OpenSSL, then it's off of or over to the OpenSSL team to publish um, bug information and vulnerability information. If it's something that's uh, specific to the whole S uh, TLS protocol, like we had the Heartbleed attack um, um, a while back, that's something that yeah may affect certain server software, but isn't really a bug in the server software itself. It was a problem with the whole uh, protocol, basically. Um, so that's a, that's a different one. Um, then it's really... Um, uh, up to the usual places where you find out about vulnerabilities, uh, bug track mailing lists, that that kind of that kind of stuff. Th no, no, normally, if it even bug not exactly in my piece of software, I can even, uh, uh, despite of that, recommend to users to use some workarounds to hide this bug. I'm sorry, say again. Uh, uh, even if it's them? if it's a problem not exactly in the my project uh, mm -hmm. in the my piece of software. Yeah. Uh, but, for example, in a Java or Teles uh, or somewhere else, I can recommend the user's way to avoid workarounds, basically, to, to avoid uh, the problem immediately, because sometimes it could be really critical. Yeah, it's, it's something I, I, I kind of tried to, to mention around the whole how you configure your protocols, how you configure the set of cipher suites. If you have a, a wrong configuration in there, it's really up to you. It's something that you need to fix on your side. There's no bug in, in the protocol or the application. It's, it's a misconfiguration, so that's a tricky bit. I've also seen misconfigurations around using the wrong certificates, using the wrong key, and which, which then causes problems. So I can't really give advice. It depends on, on how you're handling this. It's really up to you to follow best practices and have someone who understands this to some level actually do this or to some level i mean the person who are, who's reviewing this or checking these configurations should know how this whole thing works with um https it's easy to to tweak the configuration until it works but that doesn't necessarily mean that you've covered all the cases where it works but shouldn't work if you know what i mean um in terms of checking your web server, um, a good place to, to check is there's the um, SSL labs, um, SSL server security test or whatever it's called. Basically, if you look for uh, ssllabs.com and, and server test, uh, you can basically put in your host name and it will do a, a long set of, of tests and it will tell you which ciphers you have enabled. It will tell you which ones are insecure if you have any protocols enabled that you shouldn't have enabled and provide you with information about how to fix this or what can be done. Um, in some cases with the, in the past, especially with, with TLS, uh, with the early TLS versions, um, there was sometimes the, the problem that it's a security feature you want to enable, but by enabling it, you cause another security problem. So there was like a, like a catch-22 kind of setup. So in some cases, you have to decide based on your use case what makes sense. Um, but that is a, a useful site I, I use sometimes as well to make sure I, I haven't misconfigured anything. But that doesn't necessarily help you with like internal servers or like client software or Java clients that, that you, you've developed. Okay, thanks. Right. This one is even quicker. Um, you can ask the CA whether a certificate is revoked or not. But can you ask anyone uh, whether the CA is still authorized to issue certificates? Um, yes and no. Uh, browsers today typically don't really have this, like like features that would make this easy. Um, there is a I'm trying to remember the name. There is a um, what's this called? This um, Preta. Sorry. Preta. Preta. No, there's a 
like a monitoring is the wrong word, but like a monitoring system that that records um, s certificates and CA information to see if any of them may have been compromised or something. I, I can't, I'm sorry, I'm I'm missing the name. Yeah. Um, let's put it that way. Based on the protocols itself, there isn't really an easy way to do this. Let's put it that way. Uh, I think there's some research in this area. There's some first steps to to have some kind of more transparency um, around this. But yeah, if a CA has been compromised, mm, yeah, then you have a problem. I think we need to need to finish. I need to make way for the next um, speaker, which I think is you. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much.